2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. Taco Tuesday PGA DFS podcast presented to you by DFSArmy.com. Uh, it's it's good to be back. It's my first podcast of the year. I uh, just got back from Hawaii, went and saw the Sony Open there in Wailai, right by Honolulu. Uh, it was a fun experience, but boy, oh boy, was that tournament something else. I think it was the lowest scoring Sony Open in... Uh, 15 years maybe uh, it's it's been a long time since it was that bad I uh, went there on Thursday when everyone is shooting like two over on average at a course that I think historically had always shot about one stroke under par uh, just the the winds were insane uh, the course by the end of the week ended up just becoming three things there was the the fairways which held up decently the cart path and then everything else was mud Mud, as far as anyone could see, I, I completely ruined my shoes there. I saw a bunch of other guys uh, that just took their shoes off, was just living it up, mucking around the mud. But it was a fun event. Got to see the the final in the playoff right in front of my eyes. Uh, really fun time. Probably the favorite tournament I've been to, despite it being um, an absolute crap fest. Uh, but we're looking forward to my favorite tournament of the year. Uh, the Farmers Insurance Open at Torrey Pines. Now, last week we had the American Express, which was formerly known as the Desert Classic, formerly known as the Humana, the Bob Hope, etc., etc. Um, that was a three-event course, very, very similar to how uh, the Pebble Beach Pro Am will be, where every, everyone plays one course each day for the first three days, and then that weird three-round cut. And uh, even though this is a multi-course event as well, uh, we're not going to be having any of that. It's a very standard uh, cut. The, the guys will just rotate day one and day two between the north and the south course. Uh, for showdown purposes, I think everyone's going to kind of gravitate towards the guys playing the north course on the first two days. Uh, it just seems like common sense. You know, historically, the south course has... Uh, it's averaged about a stroke and a half, a stroke to a stroke and a half over par, as where the, uh, I think the north plays about a half a stroke under par. Um, not entirely sure about that one, just going off memory here, but uh, it's the, uh, looking at the south course, which is where we'll be playing both, uh, both rounds on the weekend. So they'll play the south course three times, and the north course once. Uh, the, the south course is the longest course on the PGA Tour. Uh, the only one I can think of that was longer was Aaron Hills at the U.S. Open. You know, we've had some uh, uh, we've had some come close. I think the Corrales Punta Cana's course, uh, Corrales Golf Club, that one is right there behind uh, Torrey Pines South. But Torrey Pines South, uh, Torrey Pines South is a massive 7,700 yard par 72. As where if you look at the North Course. It's a uh, it's a seven thousand one hundred and eighty yard par seventy two. So uh, save off about five hundred yards there, four hundred five hundred yards give or take. That's uh that's quite a difference. So for showdown, obviously that's going to be the primary focus is taking guys on the north course. I mean there will be a few guys that that do tear up the south course and. Uh, those would be the guys to attack the next day on the north course there, but uh, pretty common sense stuff there as far as showdown goes. Um, looking at, you know, just looking at this course a little further, uh, mainly going to focus on the south course. So uh, I just posted something on Twitter about this. Uh, you can find me at TacoDFS. 
uh, shoot me a follow over there. Uh, this course uh, is one of the, you know, with it being such a long course, everyone has to bomb it. You don't get to lay up. It's not really a thing that happens here. So you got to go for it. Uh, last year, only the uh, the Safeway Open, uh, Silverado, that course was the only one with a lower driving accuracy percentage than Torrey Pines. Uh, only 53% of the drives went in the fairway. Uh, it's real. It's kind of easy to scramble out of, but you will have a lot of long approach shots. You know, it's easily the most common type of approach shot. And uh, actually, this is the this is the course that has the uh, lowest number of strokes taken off of the fairway. Uh, so, you know, a lot of rough, a lot of sand. I think it ranks top five. And uh, strokes out of the sand, and uh, a lot of 200 plus yard uh, long irons. So we will want to be targeting some of those longer iron guys. Uh, I think the link I posted on my Twitter, to, just the stat to look into this week a little bit, was the approaches from the rough over 200 yards. Uh, had some guys that that popped there pretty interesting. Uh, interestingly, um, you can just go ahead and Google that. That'll pop right up. Just literally just type in 200 plus rough and this is the first thing that came up for me uh, but everything else you'll be able to find at dfsarmy.com check out our pga section got the research station got the domination station up and ready got domination station for uh, the showdown slates uh, looking for looking forward to a good year of pj golf and it's been an excellent year so far um you know, each week in my notes, my cheat sheet, I put you know my four core plays up there. And so far in the first two tournaments of the year, the only person that hasn't finished in the top 12 in my core has been a bizarre missed cut from Charles Howell III. It was his first missed cut on the West Coast swing in over 24 events. So um, I don't I don't mind missing that call. It's not a problem. But everything else has been uh, really strong this week. Honestly. I'm kind of just with everybody else. There are two guys in this field that are just the class of the field for me, and it's going to be hard to get me off of them. Um, might target them on different sides, but I'm definitely getting my exposure around here. But uh, before we head into the field, um, got to let you guys know that at DFSArmy.com, sign up with promo code TACO, get you that lifetime 20% off discount. We've got great things in store for the PGA Tour season. Got NASCAR coming around, Daytona 500 in less than a month, just a few weeks from now. Get excited about that. Uh, we had just a spectacular year of uh, NASCAR DFS. I, th I think, honestly, it just not even tooting horns. Like, honestly, I think that we were the most dominant uh, DFS side when it comes to NASCAR, especially the lower series. Uh, I think the first few the first few months of the year, Army members won the Octane, the $8 Octane, uh, in Xfinity and Trucks more than they didn't. I mean, most of the time we had several guys tying for the lead in that. And I would have taken it down, too, if it wasn't for freaking Brandon Jones hitting the wall by himself with a few laps to go. But that's neither here nor there. We're here to talk golf. And really excited for this again. You know, we just had my favorite European tour event. The only course I can think of besides Aaron Hills that's longer than this course, the 7,800-yard Abu Dhabi. And for the third straight year, I win a tiny little <laughs> tiny little GPP over there, some small $1, but it's kind of cool how I've won three tournaments in a row. As sad as they are, uh, DraftKings, please, just give us a little bit of love in these super strong field European tour events, please. I just hate how... It's like, doesn't matter how strong the field is, the contests are always the same. Be like a three dollar birdie for, for one k. But let's not get on too many tangents here. Um, I'm going to be referencing the research station, uh, which is just cram full of everything you can need. Complete course history, uh, recent form going all the way back an entire year. You just unhide that uh, under the recent form section, or you can use one of my favorite tools, go in the field rank tracker, and it'll just spit out, you can see, just chronologically, it'll give you a percentage from 0 to 100. 
Zero means he came in last. 100% means he won the tournament. Simple as that. Uh, really great way to uh, really track how guys are going at this part of the year, especially this part of the year. You know, in the middle of the year, you have all those 155 person fields over and over and over again every week. But um, the field sizes over the last several weeks, you know, we've had 150, 140, 30, 150, 130, 120, three straight 70, uh, 70 person no cut events. And then, you know, back in the start of the swing season, your 140s, your 150s, and of course, before that, the uh, the playoffs with the the weird number of people in there, but it's been up and down all over the place. Why not uh, just standardize that metric? Give you a real nice, easy look. Uh, so when I when I reference field rank, that is what I mean. If someone has an eighty percent field rank at a certain course, it means he beats eighty percent of the golfers that he tees it up against. It's as simple as that. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to uh, explain going in. Uh, if you know PGA. If you know DFS, uh, you'll probably understand most of the things that I'm referencing. Of course, all the statistics are um, adjusted to the field, and so you know when some when I say driving distance, what I really mean is their driving distance gained attached to the average driving distance on the PGA Tour. Uh, just helps standardize because again, you have some place like WGC Mexico where everybody's driving at 330 yards. And then you've got other courses where people are driving at 290. Uh, just, it's really good to be normalizing these kind of things. Uh, that's something I've really focused on over the last few years, getting everything down. Uh, pretty proud of the work I've got available over there at DFSArmy.com, which uh, we're going to use to dive into the slate. So let's talk about the two guys that everyone's going to talk about this week, Rory McIlroy and John Rahm. All right, these guys, class of the field, bar none. The third guy... Uh, well, we'll talk about him in a little bit. You all know who that's going to be. Uh, but, you know, outside of Tiger, and we'll get to Tiger, um, no one else in this field has a better than 3.7% uh, implied probability to win. Uh, that is, that's rake adjusted, so um, it'll be a bit lower than if you were to just look at the odds and reverse engineer them yourself. Uh, it's always good to rake adjust things. Uh, but the true implied win total or win percentage, no one in this field has above 4% as we're. Uh, Roy McIlroy is at 10%, Rahm's at 8.5%. Uh, we see you know, Rory's been 5-1 to one all week long, as we're seeing uh, John Rahm just go from 7-1 to one to 6-1. to one. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk about these guys in tandem because they have both been uh, just absolutely destroying everything that they've done you know, in, in Europe, especially Rahm. So, look at what they've been doing. You know, Rory McIlroy. Uh, this is the last time he played here. Is the DP World Tour? Uh, when was that? That was in. I think it was just a few weeks ago, isn't it? Not? That was a couple months ago. So he hasn't played since late November at the pretty much the European Tour Championships. Um, came fourth. And that was right after winning his last uh, quote unquote PGA Tour event out in China, the WGC HSBC champions uh, won that. You know, the WGCs always have uh, the best of the best, um, you know, the top 50 in the world, minus whoever withdraws. Uh, looking at you, Rosen Stenson um, came third on uh, the Zozo Championship, the last time we saw Tiger when he won there. Um, ninth at the BMW PGA Championship, that's another really strong field. In Europe, uh, second at the Omega Masters. Obviously, you won the Tour Championship. Uh, won at the Canadian. Won at the Players. Um, yeah, he had himself quite a season last year. <laughs> uh, even second at WGC Mexico. I mean, he was cleaning up the WGCs. I think he was top 10 in every one of them. Yes, he was. He was top 10 in every single WGC event, which is just insane. Uh, but... Rory kind of speaks for himself. He's going to leap off the page in every statistical category. Number one in projected round score. Uh, second in projected DraftKings fantasy points per round. Uh, same same on FanDuel. Because uh, I think Xander is actually number one uh, in that. Uh, just absolutely crushing it off the tee. 
as he does. Uh, really surprised that he made his first start here at Torrey Pines just last year, and he debuted with a fifth, pl a fifth place finish, tying John Rahm uh, at that mark. So, um, yeah, this is really a picture perfect course for him. He's one of the best on tour at gaining strokes off the tee all the time. Um, a lot of the stroke scan data is going to be really iffy this time of year. Like, for example, last week we only had the uh, the stadium course with Shot Link. No uh, Shot Link at, like, La Quinta and the Nicholas Stadium course. Uh, I think we had the same thing at the RBC, or at the RBC Heritage, the RSM Classic. Got my acronyms mixed up. Um, and I think we'll also see that at um, uh, the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, where you know, they only have the Shot Link at Pebble Beach, which is just coming off of a major being played there and uh, a lot of events like the ones in China Korea the Asian swing that we went through pretty much no shot link data there stuff like the Mayakoba classic the Bermuda championship um, especially like the the Barracuda with the Stableford scoring uh, honestly a lot of statistics are just shakier than they're going to be and we kind of go through this every year with the West Coast swing and it's one of the best parts of the year. Don't get me wrong. I love the I love the start of the season. I love the West Coast swing, going into the Florida swing and then the Texas swing. Uh, I liked how they rescheduled or they restructured the schedule last year uh, to keep the Florida swing all together. So uh, this the swings are they, they really do feel like swings, and I love the West Coast swing. And there are certainly guys that really really like the West Coast swing. You got a few of our West Wing warriors. Usually that's Charles Howell the third, but I guess not last week. I wasn't feeling it. Uh, but nonetheless, you're going to see a lot of guys here that uh, perform well year after year after year. Uh, anecdotally, I'd say the the West Coast courses just really lend themselves to steady and consistent course history for whatever reason. You see a lot of guys just with continual success here. But at the same time, uh, it's a tougher course. It's one of the leaders on tour in like double, triple, or worse bogey. Uh, percentage, you know, guys can absolutely get yeeted out of here. You know, you had Jason Day, who sandwiched two wins in between horrible miscuts, where he finished outside the top 100. Um, so yeah, it's you know everyone except for Rory and Rom up at the top. They have you know at least one miscut in, in the last like four or five years, and some of them have been missing several cuts in that span uh, but the guys who do well tend to come back and do well you see a lot of guys that have a lot of top tens here and you know it could be happenstance but you know with the Poa Nui greens I think that's the one green surface on tour that really does make a difference for people and you've got some guys that uh, excel on it guys like uh, Snedeker, uh, Rose uh, these guys you know, for some reason, uh, you just see guys that a lot of guys perform very differently uh, on POA surfaces than they do on other things. You know, especially if you're used to like a real nice Bermuda or something, it's a lot more bumpy. Um, I think it kind of standardizes the field, maybe takes away some of the advantage that a really good putter would have. Uh, but then again, you know, Jason Day's won this thing a bunch of times. Mickelson also, um, you know, a lot of a lot of great putters have done well here. But I have found that uh, putting seems to matter uh, as far as correlations and stuff like that go. It seems to matter on the north course more than the south course. Um, statistically, looking at the south course, what uh, obviously you're going to want to you know be good with your driver because you you need a good like total you, you need some total driving to both hit it deep and keep it somewhat in the fairway or at least miss the fairway in the right way um, so I've played this course a bajillion times I was you know I, I love Tiger Woods 14 love the country clubs on there and I would always take them to the front nine at Torrey South uh, just because I knew that I know that part of the course by heart so I was a complete ringer there could birdie it every single time and so I'd rack up cheap wins and oftentimes you don't really need to hit the fairway um, they're, they're just spots where you know, you got to just hit it long. But as long as you've got you know reasonable approach, 
into the greens and know which ridge to hit it on the greens and uh now you'll be fine uh so um yeah it's a really firm course you're gonna get some roll but you're also going to or you're gonna deal with some elevation here you know some of these par threes are like 50 60 feet underneath you uh, so you got a lot of interesting approaches and stuff like that i think it kind of takes away you know some of the advantage that like statistical guys uh, have it's kind of hard to explain that but um, you'd figure that things like stroke gained uh, approach would factor in a lot more, but not really. Um, really, strokes gained around the green seems to be more important here than at a usual course, and it, it makes sense. Uh, guys are going to find themselves you know, in a lot of bunkers, and they're going to be missing fairways and likely missing greens as well. I do believe at the south course, um, yeah, it's a pretty low green regulation percentage of 62 percent that's 47th out of 63 courses on the lower side there about four percentage uh, points lower than the tour average um and yeah all the sand shots i don't know if i'd necessarily target people that are you know, good out of the sand because i mean you want to get guys that don't hit it in the sand in the first place but maybe it's not the worst thing to have a guy that is just miserable from out of there so uh, when I look at stroke scanned around the green, I really just try to pick guys that aren't freaking terrible at it. That's that's uh how I like to go about that. And then off the tee, I mean, that's why Rory and Rom obviously stick out here. Of course, that's going to be important. I'm not going to look at approach as much as I usually would. Uh, this, you know, I wouldn't consider this a second shot course uh, by any means. Um, if you look at the types of uh, holes here ton of long par fours long par fives long par threes um yeah really most of the par threes here are on the longer side and there are some guys that i'm going to get off of or get on uh just based on the uh, type of holes that they're good or bad at you know some guys are just so happen to be good at the hole types that are displayed here is where you've got some guys that may specialize in the short par four short par threes short par fives of which there are significantly less of than not a normal event um and yeah a week like this it's a lot easier to get off of uh, a guy that you want to fade you don't necessarily have to play the chalk as much because it's it's on the slightly higher side of uh variance but the main stats you want to be looking at i think honestly are things like uh just long-term form you know field rank scoring average uh, just overall indicators of skill it kind of tests your overall game a little bit and uh, you know guys that have done well here um, they don't have to be coming off of you know a, a win or anything they can come off of missed cuts and just bounce back and be fine um, you know form I I'd like to see them do well last week in the first California event the Amer the American Express Desert Classic whatever um, you know it was cool if they did well in Hawaii but that's Hawaii and uh, you know honestly those events they, they kind of feel especially the century tournament of champions uh, it's kind of felt like an extension of the off season really even though it's the start of the year you've got Patrick Cantlay dialing it in early for some Mai Tais <laughs> that was hilarious but okay I think I started talking about Rory and then went back into explaining the course a little more um Rory there's not much that really needs to be said about Rory uh, over the last year, he played at seven long courses. That's one of the two uh, key field rank splits that I have for this week. Long courses and par 72s. But uh, of the longest of the longest courses he went to, he beat 94% of the golfers he teed it up against. Um, this is a good way of explaining how much better Rahm and McElroy are than the rest of this field here. Um, they both finish in the top 10% of fields over 70% of the time. The next closest in this field behind them is Hideki Matsuyama, who does that 50% of the time. There is a gap, honestly, I think. Uh, and they're both they're both perfect for this course. You know, Rom debuted here with a win. They both finished fifth last year. Uh, with how smoking hot they are all around the world, too, uh, I don't it's going to be hard to see them faltering. I mean, I know we just had a 12K just, Justin Thomas miss the cut. But, I don't know. I, 
you know, Rom's the Rom's a West Coast guy. Roy is Rory. So feeling really confident about those guys. And I'm gonna work to pay for them. On FanDuel, they're just going to be crazy chalky. I think I'm going to go a little bit of a different way on FanDuel to kind of hedge and then just really attack, uh, especially Rory on DraftKings where people may not want to pay up for him, but you know I think a lot of people are thinking the same thing that I'm thinking here. So looking at Rom here, he's only played the Tournament of Champions so far this year, finished 10th. Cool, top 10 finish. Um, there are a few guys in this course that are in this field that I'm going to be sort of fading just because of their, you know, misleading sort of game log. Like if you finish 10th at the hero world challenge, cool. You're in the bottom half of the field, but a lot of people don't know that, you know, they're fresh off of NFL looking to get into PGA. It's a thing with one, some of the biggest contests right now. Um, so you got guys just honestly just looking at recent finishes and going, Hey, top 10 streak. Um, and I'm going to kind of try to swerve away from those guys a little bit, but, uh, you know, it, it won't show this on FanDuel, which is why I kind of like playing ROM a lot on FanDuel, uh, but it will show it on DraftKings. Uh, he has been super Saiyan in Europe. He won his last two European tour events, uh, the Spanish Open, Open de España, uh, his home event there, and then the, the World Tour Championship. So you've got the two tour you know, the two championship winners of the largest tours, largest golf tours in the world. You know, I mean, you know, before that, he he had a second at the BMW PGA Championship. Um, I feel like I just said that Rory won that, didn't he? No, Danny Willett did. Nice. Uh, Patrick Reed T4, that's actually interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, I had a great playoffs. Uh, it was okay at the Tour Championship T13, but he was top five in all the other playoff events. Really strong there. Won the Irish Open uh, in between majors. He had a third at the U.S. Open, 11th at the Open Championship. Uh, Runner-up at the Estrella Dam NA Andalusia Masters, hosted by the Sergio Garcia Foundation. <laughs> I love that name uh, for an event. But yeah, he's just been out of this world. And honestly, he was like that you know, all year last year. He had more top 10 finishes on the PGA Tour than anything else. He was in the top 10 more than he wasn't. The uh, guy is insane. So those two, I mean, I could just fawn about them all day long. There's not much more to say. They're both spectacular. Um, you know, Rory's beaten 94% of the guys along courses. Rom beats 94% of the guys on par 72s uh, over the last year they had an 89% and 82% field rank respectively in 18 and 17 events you know Rom win T29 T5 at this event of course this is Rory's second time here and I, he's probably I mean he is obviously the favorite to win here but uh, it's you know it's looking like it'd be weird to not see these guys on top of the leaderboard when it uh, comes time but speaking of being at the top of the leaderboard at Torrey Pines of course it's time to talk about Tiger uh, eight-time winner here at Torrey Pines seven-time winner of this event also won the 2008 US Open here um, gonna be fairly low owned on DraftKings I think people can get to him on FanDuel I think people that play both sites are going to get their shares over there on FanDuel but $10,800 uh, coming in right behind Rom there, he's severely overpriced. Um, I think with Tiger, it's a very simple strategy this week. You play him in the large 150 max optimizer type tournaments, the mini maxes, the uh, the return return to Tory maybe. Um, I think that's 150 max. You know stuff like that. Um, I, I guarantee you he's going to be way higher owned in the single entries, the three max entries. I'd say fade Tiger in those. Play him in the, the lineups, or play him in the contest where optimizers run wild. Because I don't think any optimizer out there, if you just leave it at its base value, I really doubt it's going to give you any Tiger uh, with those guys sitting right there, especially on DraftKings. So that's my strategy with him this week. Pretty simple. 
Uh, he's finished 20th and 23rd here in the last two years. Of course, the years before that don't really even count. Uh, 2014 through like 2016, 2017. Um, kind of irrelevant <laughs> with Tiger, honestly. Uh, but before that, he won most recently here in 2013. Uh, won last time we saw him out in Japan at his own tournament, the Zozo Championships. Uh, was the fix in? No, he's just good. Uh, Tiger's won several times over the last year. Won the freaking Masters. It's Tiger Woods. You know, it kind of doesn't matter what his odds are. You know, his odds are going to be inflated. He's like 9-1 to one right now. But in reality, it's probably like 15-1 to one or so. Uh, but even with the inflated odds, even with the inflated you know, salaries on both sides, uh, doesn't matter. He's Tiger Woods. If you want to play Tiger Woods, why would you not play Tiger Woods? If you don't want to play him, sure. I get it. He's priced so high. It makes sense. But why not play some Tiger Woods? Come on. He's Tiger Woods. <laughs> Honestly, like everyone, you don't really need to talk about Tiger that much. That's the one guy everybody's got down. Uh, but honestly, his comeback is... Uh, he's, been, he's been a lot stronger than even I expected him to. And you know, one of the main things I saw from him over the last few years... Of course, the strong approach game is always there, but around the greens, um, not so much over his last 10 rounds, but uh, just overall, he's he been really solid around the greens. Uh, he maybe just kind of ate Phil's soul and devoured that part of his game, but you know he's always been a good scrambler and all that uh, going in. But anyway, moving down this field, uh, Justin Rose, your defending champion, three straight top 10 finishes for him here, and no one's really going to play him. Because we ain't seen the guy at all since the playoffs where he sucked and got kicked at the BMW Championship. I don't even think he played in the Tour Championship. Uh, don't at me if I'm wrong there. But since then, I mean, he might have played. Let's see here. Let me pull this up just in case. I feel like he played some Europe. Yeah, second at the Singapore Open on the Asian Tour. That's interesting. But yeah, other than that, the World Tour Championship finished 20th, you know. Just finishing around 20th or so in Europe a few times in a row. Uh, but the stuff we've seen from him on the PGA Tour, it's not been good. Finished mid-pack at the WGC. Of course, the bad uh, BMW Championship. Um, not a bad, like, late summer run from him but uh, you saw a lot of really strange and bizarre miscuts from him that the previous year he had absolutely none of he was coming off of like a picture perfect year uh, last season and it kind of ended in a way with his win here last year uh, but you know if he shakes the rust off he's still expensive um, you know, ownership wise we're looking at the low teens honestly it's crazy to say, but uh, your defending champion, who's got three straight top tens, he might be seriously under owned. Probably the lowest owned of any of the five digit guys, uh, unless, you know, it's, in some tournaments it might be Tiger. But yeah, not a guy that a lot of people are on, it seems. Um, I really don't mind that at all. Um, he's, he's cheaper than Xander over on FanDuel, so I expect him to be a lot higher owned over there, but I kind of like trying to get to him on DraftKings, on lineups I'm you know, not going for Rom and Rory, because I really doubt I could fit all three of those together. I really don't think it's possible. Um, moving down, we got a few good plays here to finish out the, you know, the stud range here. Uh, X-Man, Xander Schauffele missed the cut here three times in a row before finally breaking through with T25 last year at this event so good for you x he's been pretty much killing it um coming second in some small fields uh we've seen him do nothing but no cut events where he uh crushes that i think his last like four or five events have all been at uh these you know no cut super strong field wgc tournament of championship tour championship type deals um you know, tenth at the zozo third at the u.s open I mean, he he crushed the majors last year, sort of like Finau a couple of years ago, um, and the guy has obviously proven that he can win in the most stacked of fields. Um, ranks number one in projected uh, DraftKings scoring. I do believe he's, uh, he's yeah he's uh, 
Yeah, number one in the field in long par five uh, scoring. You know, gains 0.3 strokes to the field on average on long par threes. Uh, that's you know seriously good. Rory and Rom do half of that. Um, you know, so with an average of three long par fives on each course, you know, and also you know pairing that up with being top 20 in every single par four category, and also fourth in short par fives just for that you know random short par five that you'll see like the north course and stuff. So um, X Man looking like a terrific showdown play, terrific GPP play. Uh, expensive enough that his ownership is still going to be reduced, and the course history is eh, but honestly, uh, the dude's turned into a freaking star, uh, gaining all sorts of stroke T uh, to green. Just recently, he's been leaving a little on the greens, but he's also a very good POA putter. Uh, you know, over the last 10 rounds, he's lost about 0.6 strokes putting, but he gains 0.6 strokes on POA, so talk about a turnaround there. Um, and then you've got Hideki Matsuyama. Now this, I followed Hideki at the Sony. It was hilarious. All the Japanese guys were following him, and he was with, uh, I think it was Thursday, I was following him. He was with uh, Webb Simpson and Kevin Kisner, and those Japanese guys, man, they couldn't give two craps less about those guys, even though Webb is like I'd say honestly, like a better golfer than Hideki at this point. Um, yeah, they just didn't care. It was complete silence when they hit, but huge cheers whenever Matsuyama like yawned is insane. <laughs> uh, but yeah, big props to him for finishing twelfth at the Sony Open uh, for his uh, what his fifth top twenty in a row. Uh, it's crazy because he'd been absolutely terrible at that course. Uh, you know, year year after year after year, you know, he was a fade for me at the Sony just because of his awful course history. Barely made the cut, but then uh, really charged on Sunday. So kind of coming into here with some hot form. Third last year in T12, year before that. Also the T16 here in 2014. Um, statistically rates out, you know, he's a decky. T to green, yeah. Putting, eh. But he does gain... 0.2 strokes on POA. Um, yeah, anything's better than the usual uh, Hideki putting that we've seen. He's His last few events, he has just been god-awful with the putter, losing strokes almost every single round, but uh, his iron game is always on point, so, you know, if he can if he can hit it around these POA greens, he's definitely going to be someone to look out for, and he really tends to crush the West Coast swing year after year. Uh, you got Ricky Fowler, who is terrible here. And the, he's played the last six events. California kid. And, and granted, he had four straight top 20 finishes going into the 2014 season. And then he just forgot how to play Tory. Six straight times he's played this course. Has yet to break the top 60. So many miscuts. It's pretty bad. Finished T10 last week at the American Express. Uh, coming in as the betting favorite, and honestly in a field where uh, if he's going to win, that would be the field he's going to win at, you know, with all the guys at the top of the leaderboard there. But of course a random uh, guy ends up winning in Landry. Uh, so Fowler, I like to use him on the Florida swing personally. I don't think he does that great uh, on the West Coast swing, even though he's a West Coast kid. Uh, but, you know, ownership's going to be fairly reduced, I'd say. That, of course, history's going to scare a lot of people off. You want to play him, I mean, feel free. Go for it. I'm just not going to. Uh, and the guy that a lot of people are going to play this week is Gary Woodland. Now, he's probably one of the best examples I have of a guy who's, uh, whose game log is really overrated. You know, seventh at the, the Tournament of Championships. Well, that's fine, but there are only uh, 30 people in that field. You know, he played the hero and finished T7. That's fine, but what were there, like 19? Yeah, 18 people. So he finished like mid-pack, but it's going to look like he has a top 10 finish. He finished T20 in Japan. Granted, there was, you know, some other good guys there. I think Shigo won that one. Uh, but T20 in Japan, that's not necessarily that impressive. 
Uh, the other Japanese event, the Zozo, he finished fifth there. Okay, that's pretty good. The CJ Cup, T3. Uh, before that, honestly, going all the way back to his US Open win, it was all just missed cuts, T50s, nothing really that great. T15 at the Tour Championship, but that's like, what, 30 people? So I think his game, I think his recent form is seriously overrated, and you can see that with the field rank tracker. Um, it's not as green as you would expect from someone whose game log looks so good. So um, I'm just personally going to get off of him. Now, he does have four straight top 20 finishes at this course. That, that's the issue I'm running into is he is legitimately, like, really good here. Uh, even as a T10 from 2014, I think he's made seven cuts in a row here or something. Um, I think he might have made every cut. I'm not sure if that T76 was a made cut or not. Nowadays, that wouldn't be, but um, maybe he's just like MDF or something. Nonetheless, um, you know, Scary Gary going to be popular, but I'm probably going to go the other way. Or I, I'm honestly, I might try to jam him in more in a fan duel or something like that. Uh, Tony Finau. So this guy coming off of three god awful events where he finishes in the bottom 25% of the field. At uh, the Zozo, WGC China, and at the Mayakoba Classic. Uh, but step foot on the West Coast, um, and I guess he's fine. T14 at the American Express last week. Of course, it wasn't the strongest of fields, but still, um, you know, nice little bounce back from Tony. And even had the top 10 at the Shriners to start his little fall swing. Uh, so it hasn't been too bad for him. He's really been crushing greens and regulation, which. Yeah, I don't think it matters as much here, but it's definitely something. His uh, He's gaining over a stroke off the tee and approach in his last 10 shot link rounds, but also losing over a stroke putting in that span. So, um, you know, he's just an literally an average zero-stroke gain putter at POA. I'll take that over losing a stroke. That's got to, you know, regress somewhat. Uh, at a course that he obviously has figured out, I really don't mind that play at all, but he's also going to be popular along with Woodland there. Um, I think there are just a lot of other options here. Uh, Patrick Reed, who's actually number one in that stat I cited earlier, the 200-plus um, yard strokes out of the rough. Of course, that's you know just a few events played for him so far this year. Um, he's actually had a really solid string of finishes uh, in both Europe and uh, the PGA Tour until his missed cut at the Sony Open there. Uh, but... You know, if you look back a year further, Patrick Reed is actually one of the uh, lowest in that statistical category. So I think there's, you know, I don't think he's uh, like any sort of super play all of a sudden because of that. Um, some good finishes here, of course. Withdrew in 2016, but it's been all top 25 since then. Uh, I do like, I like uh, his game on FanDuel a little bit better. If you look at the fantasy scoring tab of the research station. Uh, he's ranked 32nd in projected DraftKings fantasy points per round, but 18th in projected FanDuel fantasy points per round. You got a few guys like that. Like I think Rose is significantly better on DraftKings. Jason Day better on DraftKings. Snedeker better on FanDuel. Uh, really, your guys are better at par threes and not bogeying are better on FanDuel. The guys that are good at getting eagles and birdieing better on DraftKings. Kind of a rule of thumb. That's my favorite way to hedge between the two sides and pick who you're going to play where if you play both sides. Um, so Reed, you know, probably a solid play. Just, uh, I don't know. You know, coming off the miscut, I think that'll really knock his ownership down a bit. Uh, but yeah, I do like uh, playing him over there in FanDuel. Uh, Sung JM at $9,100. Uh, debuted here the T52 finish last year. Eh. But he's just been grinding it out like super hard. Uh, I've I have him as a cash gameplay currently. He does rank fourth in projected fantasy points per round, and he's second in uh, birdies or better gained. Uh, so definitely a GPP play. But he's just been playing so consistently and so often as he does, and you know since the fall swing started, he literally has six top twenty finishes already and no missed cuts. Uh, the dude's just. Swear to God, he's like he's the ultimate grinder. I'm pretty sure he played the most events last year. Yeah, uh, him and apparently Sebastian Munoz, those guys just grinding it out all the time. And Adam Shank too, but not this week because he withdrew. So if you have Adam Shank in your lineup, get him out of there. 
All right. Um, then to finish out the 9K range here, Jason Day. Very polarizing figure. I've figured out what I'm going to do with him. And I'll tell you, honestly. Um, he's 36 to 1. I live in Indiana. One of the few things that our state has done right. Um, you know, unlike Fantasy Draft, which I'm... Or not Fantasy Draft, but uh, Super Draft, which I'm not allowed to play. Boo. Because uh, that's been fun over there. The Army guys have been crushing it over there. But you look at Jason Day. He has, what, four top five finishes sandwiched around two awful missed cuts in 2017-2016. Um, in 2018, or I think it was 2015, where it lo he looked like he was going to withdraw, and he was like, nah, psych, I'm a win. And did it again in 2018. T5 last year. I'm just going to bet him outright and fade him on... Fade him in fantasy. That's my plan. Uh, you know, probably hedge of the top five or something, but, you know, now that's legal in my state, I mean, I love using sports booking, you know, to get a, uh, to get in, well, get an edge with a hedge, you know. Um, used to really depend on draft.com for that. Apparently, those guys are gone now. It sucks. I think they're going to be integrated into FanDuel sometime soon, which would be cool. Because uh, I really love the, the concept of live snake drafting. Uh, it really, you know, it's a lot of skill expression. Be able to draft live and stuff, and you can take advantage of guys auto drafting stuff like that. But um, until then, you know, we gotta look to get my hedges off on some sportsbook bets, and I think Jason Day thirty six to one to win at a course that he's won at like you know, several times over the last few years. Yeah, I'm gonna take that and run. Uh, so that's a perfect little hedge for me. His, his form coming in is just awful, but I think if if he's on, he's gonna be like on and threaten to win this thing. That's just kind of how I see it. Uh, a couple of young guys that are seriously impressive uh, to start off this upper 8K range, Colin Morikawa and Scotty Scheffler. Uh, Scheffler has been just insane uh, to start this uh, to start his career, honestly, because he just started. Just came up from the Web.com tour where he won multiple times last year, and I think he was top 10 in the championship as well. Uh, started off his PGA Tour career with the 7th at the Greenbrier, then 16th at the Sa uh, Sanderson Farms. Missed a cut by a stroke at the Shriners, and then since then, T28 at Houston, 3rd at the Bermuda Championships, 18th at Mayakoba, 5th at RSM, and last week, 3rd at the American Express. Dude is, uh, I think he's 3rd in the field behind only Sungjae and Rory, and birdies are better gained. Um, you know, so far a field rank of 82%, 90% at par 72 courses, um, you know, really crushes it off the green, hits it 307 about with 64% driving accuracy, just insane stuff. It's all going to regress, of course. Um, has not putted that great on Poa in the very few times that we've seen him, uh, but still Scheffler, you know, insane looking game log, um, Definitely someone that people are going to just uh, hop on. You know, he was one, I think he was the highest owned person last week. Uh, and then you've got Morikawa, who I kind of like a little bit more than him. Uh, West Coast guy for sure. Um, actually, you know, I, I thought that he hadn't played at Wailai uh, when I was covering the Sony Open initially. And then I find out mid tournament that he actually played there as like a little kid, like a 10 year old. Um, Got a lot of ties to like Hawaii, and I think he went to school in the West Coast. I do believe or grew up there. So, um, and he's never missed a cut in 14 events uh, on his uh, PGA Tour career. I think I think it's 16 actually. Yeah, he's never missed a cut. Uh, won at the Barracuda Classic, so birdieing ain't no problem for him. He can he can definitely throw throw down some birdies. Um, you know, gains 2.5 to the field on average. Pretty sick. Um, just super good. 64% uh, of the time he's finishing in the top 25% of the field. Uh, of course, you know, Scheffler, it's 82% of the time. But, I mean, that's got to regress, you think, man. Like, shoot. he's. Uh, these guys are just running so hot. I just think Morikawa is going to come in lower owned than Scheffler, who's, you know, he's playing well, but not, like, as ridiculously well. Uh, and you know, I followed Morikawa for a good while when he was with uh, Palmer and Webb on the final day at Sony, and he 
his shots are just beautiful. I loved how he just walks up and whacks it and just walks to the next hole or the next shot. Like I thought that was amazing after watching all these guys just play so slow, waiting for just the right gust of wind. Um, and Mark Howe is someone I've just been kind of miring you know, from the get-go here. So definitely someone I'm on. Going to start moving faster through this field, of course. Don't want the longest podcast ever. Already pushing like an hour. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of briefly go through these guys, uh, point out the main guys I'm going to be targeting here. Really just thoroughly break down this course. And then, of course, always remind you guys that if you're not already a member at DFSArmy.com, hop in my PGA room, man. We'll talk PGA all day. Um, get access to all of our tools. We cover uh, every daily fantasy sport. Um, you do a really, really solid job with that. Uh, you name it, we got it. Uh, all included in one one a very affordable package subscription. Uh, the key to it all is Slack. Get in the Slack chat. It is a really great place. Uh, we're seriously vibing over there. We have a very good time in the PGA room. The PGA room is like the most you know, polite and, well, it, with the exception of Thursday mornings, uh, it's really the, one of the most chill rooms that there is. You know, probably up there with like tennis. Uh, so definitely a fun place to be. And of course you want to check out this research station, domination station, line of optimizers uh, for week long and showdown. Uh, so yeah, promo code TACO, get you that lifetime 20% off discount. Now let's keep rolling with this field here. Um, Jordan Spieth is here after withdrawing with a cold from Hawaii. Seriously, who skips out golfing in Hawaii? Come on, that's must have been one heck of a cold. Um, so who knows with him? His field rank over the last year is 65%. That's pretty bad. That's like, that's like bad. <laughs> Jason Day is slightly lower, but man, that's it's not very good. He just had a real lackluster year constantly. And it was like, he was killing it with his approaches like two years ago and forgot how to putt. And then he remembered how to putt last year and just completely forgot everything else. He's losing a billion strokes off the tee consistently. All he can really do is putt, and he's a worse putter on POA. Uh, just a kind of a picture-perfect like non-play for me, like a very easy fade. I think his ownership's going to be minuscule, and I or don't really care. If you want go for it, man. I only play Spieth in one spot and one spot only, and that is round two showdown, or... Apparently, it's just like the god of all all things round two whenever Tommy Fleetwood isn't in the field. So there's that for you. Really, round one and two. These were his averages last year. He averaged 41 and 44 in the first two rounds and 32 and 30 in the final two rounds. So don't play him in four-day. Just don't do it. That's Just don't do that with speed. Don't subject yourself to that. You're just going to... You're just going to cry at the end of the the tournament, especially after Spieth's like T3 after Friday and it's got your hopes up. He's just done that way too much. I'm not falling for it anymore. Uh, right underneath Spieth is a guy I'm huge on. It's a West Coast swing. I uh, love me some Snedeker on Poa. Uh, he's just so good. He's like CH3 levels of good on the West Coast. Uh, of course, hopefully he doesn't CH3 me this week, but uh, his history here really speaks for itself. Uh, starting at 2010, second, ninth, win, second, horrible miscut in 2014. Uh, and then 19th, win, ninth. And the last two years have not been as hot for him, 45th and 62nd, but those were during, um, you know, some real, uh, re he had some stretches of really bad form there. I think he was going through uh, reworking his swing, got a different swing coach. I think it was... Uh, is it like Tigers or Jason Day or Jason Day's swing coach or something like that. I don't I don't know. I'm just it's late. All right, but um, Snedeker's turned it around since then. He's made a bajillion cuts in a row, and yeah, just had a course that he crushes constantly. Eighty four hundred bucks on DraftKings is so cheap. I love that. Uh, but he's a better play on FanDuel, I think, with how he scores. And I'm personally just going to use him for cash games, honestly. On DraftKings, definitely making the cash game lineup. Um, you got Mark Leishman, who has uh, you know, s several top tens here. Uh, we'll probably go overlooked with the guys around him. Not 
the worst guy he could pick up. I don't like how he's been losing birdies to the field recently, though, but, um, you know, getting Aussie near the Pacific, and apparently they're really good. <laughs> uh, I keep seeing that, man. All those Australians went off in Hawaii is insane. Uh, it even had one winning, of course. Um, Matthew Wolf, $8,200, a good cheap price for him. You know, he's a he's a bomber. He should do pretty well here, I'd imagine. Uh, he's been losing over the last 10 rounds, so he's lost a bunch of strokes approach. Um, if that could regress at all, I'm, you know, that's going to be fine because off the tees, he's putting in work. But uh, moving on to uh, right at the 8K range here, you got two guys that really will pop off the page for a lot of people, I think. And that is Ryan Palmer, who I am fading this week. I, you know, it seems like a great spot for him, but I don't know if I want to fall for that. Uh, he's another guy like Woodland, who has a very good uh, recent game log, and you know his fourth at the Sony was really nice. I was following him that final round, and you would have never thought that he would be like in contention with how, with how often he just like outburst and cussed after like every shot, even when it was a perfectly fine shot. Uh, call him like the Kyle Bush of golf or something, but usually this guy is the most inconsistent golfer on tour. I think over the last two years, his finishes, if you just look at it, they're wild all over the place. Uh, not much consistency with his game, and then all of a sudden he's got you know con some consistency here, four straight top 20 finishes, and then at this course, you know, uh, missed the cut here in 2010, then didn't play it until... 2018 and then over the last two years he had a runner-up finish and then a t13 last year uh so you know that history along with a you know, very good looking game log is going to lead to him being very chalky um my plan with him currently is to fade him in gpp and cash because i would never play ryan palmer in cash he's always been my example of a guy to play in gpps only uh, but i'm just gonna i'm just playing him on fanduel at this point his odds are actually getting pretty decent down to like 48 to 1 surrounded by guys in the 60s and 70s uh, but I think he's just gonna get too popular he might be 18 to 20 percent owned by the time that you know lot comes because a lot of people are seeing just how well he's been playing but I don't think he's that kind of guy I think uh, a random horrible miscut is a bit overdue for him uh, I call it the gambler's fallacy or whatever but usually this is not how Ryan Palmer operates if, if he keeps winning all the way to the Texas swing then I'll just start abusing him uh, and then, probably the best play on the slate here, definitely making my core here, and if you've been following uh, both me and Josh's notes, uh, he's on there every single time. It's Lanto Griffin. What a start to a career. You know, this is a 31-year-old rookie on the PGA Tour. Starts off his season, uh, starting in the fall swing, just 13th, 11th, 17th, 18th, and then it culminates with a win in Houston absolutely insane and then comes back a few weeks later another top 20 finish so he starts off with a PGA Tour career official career with six straight top 20 finishes just absolutely insane then the following two weeks he misses the cut by one stroke each uh, to really bring his ownership down a lot although this guy still is always uh, pretty popular and then what do you know two straight top 20 finishes after that seventh most recently at the Sony Open, and everyone was super mad. He was like four over early on Thursday, and you know people are losing their mind. You know, it's like when Brooks was plus five at the PJ or the the U.S. Open last year. I think it was last year, or the year before. We ended up winning after starting five over. Um, of course, I didn't. You know, we didn't expect the weather to be as horrible as it was, but. Uh, just an amazing showing from him. He's really been closing out tournaments well. And he's actually played at this course before. In 2018, he finished T12 here. Uh, just rates out stupid strong uh, in pretty much every category. Gaining strokes in every category. Even putting over his last 10 rounds where he's gained .01. Hey, it's still positive. And on POA, he averages over a stroke gained per round. Um, gaining tons of birdies. Hits it long and accurate. Just, I mean, there's not much more to say about the guy. He's, he's just super good, you know, to start off his career. I uh, just gotta keep rolling with it, dude. Seven thousand nine hundred dollars. Uh, a lot better than Molinari, who <laughs> was god awful last week. Um, 
Yeah, I'll definitely take Lanto, Lanto over him, and I'm just going to eat that ownership. Hopefully Palmer cannibalizes his ownership a good amount. I'll let everyone else have Palmer. I'm going Lanto Griffin. Uh, then moving down a little further here, um, Grillo's interesting. Champ I don't, apparently is good now after a, just an awful season last year. Uh, missed the cut here horribly last year, but he's a California kid. Hits it 324 off the tee. Like he's, he's the longest driver, so I mean, you'd figure this course would work for him. But hey, um, he's off the tee numbers, looking like a Rory, looking like a Rom. It's just um, a lot of inconsistencies elsewhere. I think he loses strokes in every other category. Uh, but hey, if there's a place to bomb it out at, you know, why not the longest course? Um, I like Benny on coming off a missed cut. Uh, he was in pretty good form before that. Although he is... Uh, if you thought he was a bad regular putter, he's an even worse POA putter. So I don't know if I'd put too much stake in that. Um, got Russell Knox. I have him as a cash play here at $7,600. Uh, he's just made a bunch of cuts in a row. He's made 84% of his cuts over the last year. And then at around the same price point, Kokrak, while he's just coming off a missed cut um, and finished like dead last at the Zozo, um, he ranks 12th in projected fantasy points per round and made 87% of his cuts over the last year. Uh, he had a re he had a much better year last year than a lot of people want to remember, and he was 20th here in this event last year. Uh, so this this range has a lot of pretty decent plays here. You got Collie who finished 13th last year, coming off the fourth at the American Express Open. Uh, he's been putting together a lot of random top tens. Uh, looks like he has fully recovered uh, and back to. Uh, you know, if, if he gets back to the form that he was in before, he's not going to be a 7K guy. He's probably going to be an 8K, almost 9K guy. Uh, you got to remember that before he was in that horrible car accident, he was actually uh, really good and really consistent, and he has been for a while. You got Bubba Watson, who has not played here in five years, uh, but won here in 2011, and since then has yet to finish outside of the top 25. He just hasn't really played much recently. Um, in god-awful form, the last two years have been super rough for him, the worst years of his career. But he has a 57% average field rank, but in eight events played on long courses last year, 77% field rank. I mean, it's Bubba. Bubba's going to bomb it out there. Um, so, I mean, this place makes some sense for him. I remember him and Phil finished uh, in 2011. They finished first and second. Speak of the devil, they're the same price. They put the lefties together at $7,500. Now, Phil, he missed the cut horribly last week at his best course. And also, he didn't even play at Houston, which is his other best course. It's kind of shocking to me. Uh, the guy needs to turn it around somewhere. Maybe WGC Mexico is his best event now. Um, ranks 119th in the field and projected fantasy points per round, which is where he usually makes it up. Like, you know, he's usually, like, he's been bad, but at least he, like, birdies a lot. Now he's just, like... Not good. Only hitting fifty percent of his fairways. Like horrible driving accuracy, and he's not really been scrambling like he usually does. Um, just hemorrhaging strokes off the tee. Just right there with Spieth, honestly, and like don't touch range. I mean, if you want to play him, go for it, dude. But man, that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna be tough to convince me to play him. I uh, got Harris English, who had the hottest start to the swing season outside of maybe Lanto, uh, but. Starting the swing season, he finished 3rd, 6th, 33rd, 4th, and 5th. What an insane run. Then missed the cut horribly when everyone played him at the RSM Classic. And then no one really played him. Well, yeah, he was reasonably high on last week, but T48, it's not really all that inspiring. Uh, missed the cut here last year, but before then, I had three top 15 finishes in his last four years, all made cuts, and a runner-up finish. In 2015, I feel like that was a playoff loss, if I recall correctly. I uh, got Joel Damon at the same price, top 10 last year, and uh, 12th at the Sony last time out, 6th in Mayakoba, uh, three events before that. Uh, the thing is, though, last week he withdrew. I don't remember if he cited a reason or, wh or whatnot, but I don't know. He went to Cali, went to go chase the Cali girls instead of uh, working. I, I guess I can understand that. I've got Keegan Bradley, who over the last three years has made all his cuts here with two top five finishes. Coming off a T12 finish at the Sony, where, of course, as usual, he starts off super hot round one, but for once in his life, he didn't fizzle that off. Um, he's another guy like Spieth, except for instead of having two rounds he's good at, he just has the one. 
You look at uh, his averages. Yeah, Keegan Bradley, 39.5 uh, fa- uh, showdown fantasy points in round one, and then 34 in round two, and 33 and 32 in round four. Just one of those guys, you know. Um, I guess Cameron uh, Tringali is kind of the same sort of way. But what I like about these little Thursday Warrior guys, I love them in like cash form- uh, formats. Um, Keegan has a lot of like odds to pricing value here, so I think he'll uh, get fairly popular, even though he's been off the radar for a while. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, there's a, there's a similar play here in this range. Uh, first, I'd like to touch on Munoz, who I've just consistently been playing all the time. Though I don't really like this course as much for him, but he still rates out top 10 in projected fantasy points per round because he's just such an awesome DraftKings scorer. Um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, let's go right here to Rory Sabatini, the good Rory. Uh, $7,200. He made uh, 85% of his cuts over the last year. Very cheap price tag for him. Uh, ranks 10th in projected fantasy points per round. 8th in projected round score. Uh, made his last four cuts over the last five weeks. You know, Pretty solid form, but no top 20 finishes or anything like that. Um, had two top 20s in his last three events here, but 70th last year. Um, yeah, just a awesome spot to use him there. I think he's cash safe too. Finishes in the top 50% of fields 90% of the time, which is uh, really good for cash. I've got Tyler Gooch at the same price, third here last year and 17th last week. Uh, just, you know, he's put together some uh, made cuts. You know, I think he's made every single cut, maybe. Maybe miss it. I think he barely missed, like barely, barely missed at the Greenbrier and at Shriners. But other than that, it's just been made cuts for him and some decent finishes. Fourth in Houston. Um, yeah, and you gotta like uh, we've seen from Tyler recently, Lucas Glover, who no one's going to be on his last four events. Uh, really, every single event except for his ninth at the Shriners so far this swing season has been pretty bad. But as we saw last year, this dude will always just hop out of nowhere and just bam, top fifteen. He doesn't he doesn't really like to do much besides just missing cuts and then coming top fifteen. Maybe he'll uh, strike us with a little bit of that. Uh, better POA putter uh, than he's been putting lately. And his approach game strong. I mean, you know, I don't mind uh, taking a seriously low-owned shot at Glover here. And at the same price, Nick Watney, another guy, has four top 10s here uh, since 2010. But his last four events, I think he's missed the cut almost every single time. Just T58 in 2018. Uh, it's not been too hot, but he has had an all right start to the swing season so far this year. And early into this year, 29th last week. Uh, this is a play I really wanted to touch on here. Denny McCarthy at $7,100. He's had pretty much a, a picture-perfect start to the year for himself. He's made every single cut, uh, top 50 in every single event that he's played, and they've pretty much all been uh, the full field events, 150-person fields. So seriously impressive start for him. His game log's amazing. Gaining a ton of birdies to the field, top ten in projected round score, uh, you know, eighty-three percent of his cuts made going over, the, uh, going back the last like six months. So, here's the thing with McCarthy though, he's crazy cheap, seven thousand one hundred dollars, a uh, very obvious value play. But uh, in two in two starts here, he's missed the cut every single time. Here's the thing about McCarthy. At this point, it's safe to say that McCarthy is the best putter on the PGA Tour. And it doesn't even seem close. You don't have, like, Jason Day doing his usual thing. You don't have, like, guys like Fowler or Ricky tearing it up. It is just... McCarthy is leading the way, bar none, gaining two strokes putting on average over his last 10, one and a half over his last 50. I mean, he's number one in the field every single week when it comes to putting. He loses .4 strokes on average on POA. So that is the angle I'm going at here. He literally depends on his putter, and he's one of the few guys that can actually do that. But this is not his preferred surface. I'm hoping that everyone plays him, and I'll just be off of him. Uh, that would It just feels like a really good fade to make. I think it's been a good train. I've been on McCarthy. He's made me a lot of money recently, but uh, it's time to hop off this gravy train for now. Uh, Tringali, I mentioned him earlier. He has he looks sort of like Ricky over his last six events here. Some pretty bad history, but um, 
He's made 90% of his cuts. The dude's just been really good. Super solid approach game, but uh, maybe I will. Maybe he'll be like Munoz for me, where you know, I love. I've been loving playing these guys. But maybe just take a little bit of a step back uh, with the course fit not entirely being there. I mean, he'll probably make the cut, but finish like T50. That's probably what's gonna happen. I uh, got Brendan Steele, who I got to watch choke in front of my eyes, and I laughed hysterically. What a horrible finish to the tournament for him at Sony. It was literally all putting from him, and once that went away, just as expected, he faltered in, in horrible fashion. Just gifted Cam Smith that win there. But uh, he's kind of low-key been putting it together after two horrifyingly bad seasons. And this is a course that, with the exception of a horrible miscut, uh, missed cut last year when he forgot how to golf, had the yips or whatever, um, he's actually crushed this course consistently. Maybe not like cross crush, but always making the cut, always coming like top 30. And really, if you look back further, like over the last five, six years or so, Brendan Steele, you know, he crushes the West Coast swing. He's a West Coast guy. Uh, year after year, it's just recently, he used to be like a cash game stud. If you've only been playing fantasy golf for the last couple of years, you're not going to believe me because Steele's been awful. But uh, he actually had, you know, he was a cash game lock for years, honestly. Uh, so looking at him a little bit, I don't like guys who just do it all, you know, with the putting really, but he does gain a lot of strokes approach and historically he's been a good long iron player. Um, let's just work through the rest of this lower, lower range here. You've got Carlos Ortiz, who's had a seriously hot stretch here. Um, seven straight made cuts in the swing season with three top four finishes jammed into that all at full fields. Uh, so kind of eye opening his results there. Missed the cut here last year, but does have a T11 finish here from back in 2015 at $6,900. That's really, really strong play. I got Sepp Straka, who is absolutely terrible this year outside of two fourth place finishes one coming last week uh, and he was someone that just popped out of freaking nowhere on the projected fantasy points per round uh, stat but that ended up being just crucial last week and you can only find that here at dfsarmy.com promo code taco hey but yeah all the guys in the at the uh, top of that statistical category last week they all finished in the top 10 they all crushed and yeah, Straka debuted 13th here last year. Uh, before that awful run that he had mid swing season, really just over the last few months or so, he wasn't bad. And he does do better at like these longer courses and stuff because he's seriously good off the tee, very accurate, and hits at a smidge over 300. Um, definitely, I really I prefer him in showdown. Honestly, he's definitely like a fantasy point scoring showdown kind of guy. Um, and I guess you could almost say the same about Ortiz, but moving down here, you've got, um, you, know, you do have some significant line swings. Obviously, Shank is dropping off here as he's withdrawn. Um, yeah, I'm sure the books will, would love you to, uh, would love to bait you into betting him there, but uh, Cam Davis has gone from 167 to 1 to 136 to 1. Pretty big swing there at 7,000 bucks. He missed like every single cut until the last two years where he suddenly remembered how to golf top 10 at the Sony and then top 30 last week. Um, yeah, and guys like Tony Finau, guys like Tony uh, uh, John Rahm, uh, these guys have been popping up. Of course, Ryan Palmer. Just, you know, the odds drifts available on the research station, always automatically updating. Uh, they can give you the scoop on, you know, which people are being bet up, and you can use that to your advantage. Like, uh a guy who seriously redeemed himself last year, Doc Redman, at $6,500 on DraftKings. He's gone from 240 to 1 to 207 to 1 currently. Uh, he has a ton of top 30 finishes, honestly. Uh, it's kind of crazy. You had that miscut the Sony when everyone was using him, but uh, he has, looks like he has four top 25 finishes at full field events since the start of the swing season. I mean, that's pretty darn good. Uh, 13th at Houston, probably his best finish there. Um, I think it was, I don't remember his at the Barracuda, but uh, that was a little while ago. If you look at his uh, his field rank splits, he's 66% in field rank, better than Jordan Spieth, hilariously. Uh, but at, at uh, par five or at par 72s, 
Everyone would be good at par fives, but par 72s, 82% in five, eight, uh, five uh, par 72 courses he's played at. Uh, so really not a bad bet there. Uh, I've got a few other interesting plays right in this range. Norlander, who uh, had two top 10 finishes in a row and just barely squeaked by the cut last week. Um, another similar guy, Trahan, who also finished top 10 with uh, Norlander, at the RSM Classic, and also just barely squeaked by last week. But uh, I gotta give him props for for doing that because that was a horrifyingly bad course for him. Like his course history is just all miscut. So honestly, that's like an improvement. He rates out top fifteen in both projected round and projected fantasy point per round. Uh, so you know Trahan, even though he's like two hundred and twenty to one and has one finish here where he finished one hundred and forty eighth in twenty twelve. Other than that, honestly, he's looking pretty solid. In 17 events played over the last year, he's beaten 70% of the golfers he's teed up against. It's not shabby. And he gets it mostly done off the tee and with his around the green game. And I don't know what more you could ask for him. Uh, if you look into what's making his uh, fantasy scoring uh, projections pop so much, I'll tell you in a little bit once I figure that out myself, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, so... A lot of par five or a lot of long par fives here. He's fourth in the field, or sorry, par threes. A lot of long par threes on this course. He's fourth in the field, long par th or par three scoring and top twenty, in uh, well that's short par five scoring, uh, but still top fifty in long par five, long par four, uh, and the and medium par four scoring, which is, you know, it's going to be important here, especially the long par four, long par five stuff. And for someone so cheap in the field, you know, um, makes a lot of sense. He's not someone you would think of as like a big stud, but I mean, there you go. Let's move up a little bit here. I, I skipped over two pretty important guys here. The two uh, rookie M's, yeah, Matthew, uh, Matthew Neesmith and Maverick McNeely. So these guys are going to come off the same to a lot of people. They both just started, starting with the false, uh, false swing, moving up from the Corn Ferry Tour. Uh, McNeely has played here before, uh, top 30 finish in 2018. Uh, Neesmith is arguably hotter, though. He has uh, the T17 last week and T14 at the RSM Classic, T18 at the Shriners. Uh, but McNeely, he's made, I think, seven cuts in a row now at this point. They've, they've both been doing pretty well. Now, I prefer McNeely over Neesmith. And if you look at Neesmith, he's, been doing, he's just like McCarthy, been doing his... His work uh, mostly on the greens, and he loses 0.7 strokes on POA so far in his career. That's where he's been averaging a stroke gain putting otherwise. Uh, and he's been losing strokes around the green as well. I think that's kind of a recipe for disaster here. He's still underpriced, and at 180 to 1, surrounded by a bunch of guys that are like 250 to 1. I mean, it makes sense, but I'm going to go with Mav. He's played this course before, he's done well there. Um, just making cut after cut. He's made 78% of his cuts so far in his career. 75% uh, field rank at par 75s. Overall, 78% field rank, which is better than Jordan Spieth. Finishes in the top 50% of fields, 78% of the time. Love me some McNeely. Um, that's probably going to be where I'm going uh, when I'm not hitting that $6,500 range for Redmond. Uh, and a little bit of, a little Norlander, a little Trey Han, a little Bohog. Who uh, has been someone that we've liked recently until he withdrew last week? Jerk. Uh, and now getting into the dumpster. And if you're still listening, I mean, God bless you, man. You've got uh, Tim Wilkinson, the guy that made me rich several years ago. He actually remembered how to golf after just being horrible for a few years, chilling on the Corn Ferry Tour. Uh, but 30th, 32nd, and 21st in his last three events, you know, most of those he just popped off in round one and just kind of backslid, but still. Half interesting play. You got Hank Lebioto, who debuted top 30 here last year, 17th last week, third at the Bermuda Championships. Interesting little play. I don't think he's very good statistically, though. And then Brandon Wu, who, um, just a good example of why you should always look at sample size here. He rakes out number one in this field at the key par three range, the long par threes, but he only has like 30 holes played of that type so uh, don't look too much into that but still I mean the guy can bang 
he's made every cut so far. This year, he's finished 17th at the Houston Open, 55th at the Mayakoba Classic, and then you know, he missed the cut at the Open Championship, but he did hang around and finished T35 at the U.S. Open this last year. Very impressive. It's such a cheap price. Eh, why not? Uh, hell, you could even pick Ted Potter Jr. if you want to, but I think that might be uh, overweighting recent form. A bit much, I'd say. Um, and then finishing out this this garbage range, there are some interesting plays here. Um, Sebastian Kaplan, uh, he and Palmer have something very interesting that I found. They're both operating at the lowest odds they've ever been at uh, over the last year. They're the only guys in the field that are at their lowest odds point ever. I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, that's why I made Palmer my one and done play as well. I think that's a good strategy uh, to implement there. Play him in one and done, fade him in DFS. A hey, another hedge. It's all about the hedge life. Um, you've got a couple of guys here who used to kill this course and now are bad. You've actually got a few examples of that. Like Sung Yul No, but I think he's past saving at this point. Or J.J. Spawn, who has just absolutely forgotten how to golf. But there are two plays that are very interesting to me down here. The first one is John Ha. If you remember a few years ago, Ha used to actually be a decent cash game play. Uh, then he just forgot how to golf, sort of like Steel over the last few seasons. Went down to the Corn Ferry Tour. Uh, but he's back now. Made the cut last week. I mean, you know, he's got some seriously good history. Uh, I think he's made his last four or five cuts in a row, including uh, some top ten finishes there. $6,100. I mean, that's, you know, if you're going to go for Rom and Rory together, it's not the worst thing you could do in GPP. And you've got another example at dead minimum. Two more examples, actually. No, three more examples of guys who have multiple top ten finishes here at, and are dead minimum price, and I'll explain all of them. First is... Hunter Mahan, another Cali kid who uh, he's forgotten how to golf completely. He's not good anymore, but he's finished six here twice in a row in 2011, 2012. That was a while ago. Now, KJ Choi, that's more interesting. It's more uh, recent. He actually finished 16th at the CJ Cup this year, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, but since 2013, he has a ninth and he has two runner up finishes here, which I found to be very interesting. But the last two times he's played, of course, he's missed the cut horribly. And he also screwed me over when I played him in one and done last year at the Genesis Open where he had finished top 30 for, I think it was 17 straight years or something. But nope, missed the cut horribly. Very sketchy, but still, min price? I mean, it's min price. And then you've got Graham Dillette at $6,000. Now, this is an injury situation, right? If this was full form Graham Dillette, like full health, reverse three years, he would be like in the 8K range. I don't think he deserves to be dead minimum price, but the thing that's got me worried is he's 500 to 1. That's pretty crazy for a guy who's not all that far removed from being in a playoff to win this event. Uh, but he's only made one cut this year, T58 at the Mayakoba Classic. Like, I mean, obviously, you know, he's down here for a reason, but. I just thought that was very interesting. Um, just a play that kind of spoke to me. And then one final guy from... No, two final guys from the garbage bin. The garbage bin is actually interesting this week for once. You got another injury guy in Jamie Lovemark, who even though he's like seen as like a super young guy that just started really on the PGA Tour a couple of years ago, he's actually played this event six times. Uh, again, another Cali kid. of his played, played here a lot as an amateur. And uh, yeah, he's he has one made cut so far this uh, this year, but really hasn't played too much. I uh, don't really know too much about his form, but again, if he was in full form from like two or three years ago, he'd probably be right around the Dillette range, uh, if not higher. For a while, he was looking like he was going to be a really good player. I uh, led the Web.com tour in total driving the year before he graduated, uh, but. All right, fine. Two more plays. I swear I'll be done with this podcast, guys. Uh, welcome back to these very long podcasts. If you're at work and just bored, you're welcome. But two more plays from the very bottom of this field. 
Probably shouldn't play them, but they're worth mentioning. First is Trey Mullinex, 25th here last year. Missed the cut in 2018, but T49 in 2017. So, I mean, reasonable success here. Um, he is coming off a very long injury stint, and he hasn't played since the... Uh, uh, it's not the Bermuda Chain. I'm looking at it. it's the 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 nickname is BC, the Barracuda champ. No, no, the Barbasol Championship. God, I gotta start. Uh, I gotta quit saying BC. There are too many BCs now. Uh, but that's the last time we saw him play, and he had been dealing with an injury, and he was actually decent to start the year. Had good finishes in the West Coast Swing. Uh, 16th at the RBC Heritage, but then he just fell off a cliff and ended up having to take several months off because uh, he just totally forgot how to golf there. But uh, Molinax, when he's healthy, he hits the ball probably the second longest of anyone in this field behind Cam Champ. So that's interesting. Of course, it's his first time out, so you know I would not bet too much money on him. It's just a very interesting uh, play to point out here. And then you've got the biggest mover on the books for whatever reason. And that's Brandon Hagee. Dead minimum price. Started the week at 435 to 1. Right now he's at 328 to 1. That's literally his line shifted by 25%. That's massive. I mean, the second most that we've seen a guy move this week is Cam Davis moved 18%. And that's still some pretty massive movement. Uh, so. Not really sure if he was just mispriced at first to begin with, or if you know people are betting on him for whatever reason. Doesn't have like a great history here. Made the cut a couple times, but like just barely squeaked by. Um, started the season off by missing four cuts in a row and then withdrawing at the Houston Open, taking uh, over a month off, I think two months off, and then coming back. And he's made two of his first three cuts to start the year. He's another long guy off the tee, 311 yards. Uh, with his drive, so that's something, but I don't know. I don't know if I buy that yet. The the line movement is just interesting, so uh, there, you, there you have it. The Farmer's Insurance Open, my favorite course and my favorite event to watch. It's going to be a great one. Um, it'll be really fun to uh, to take this all in before I have to start you know, focusing on uh, NASCAR as well, but we're definitely going to have that ready. Uh, and somehow make 20, or 2020 a better season than 2019 in NASCAR, but that's going to be hard. Uh, and of course, in PGA, we're uh, continually you know, moving forward and innovating, you know, doing a lot of work with the showdown stuff right now. Uh, we've been having a lot of success. I think the first showdown slate of the year, we had a guy uh, just w win the whole thing, win, uh, I think he won 1000 bucks. We've had a few pretty solid winners in showdown so far. Uh, and Josh DFS up no up north, he writes some really good notes for it every night. Uh, and of course, the domination station up and ready for you. Um, just shortly after the rounds end, for the most part, um, but definitely by like midnight each night, uh, you can expect them. Another good thing about this West Coast swing, tee offs at noon. I love it. <laughs> Ain't got to worry about much. You can. You don't have to set your lineups at night and then try to wake up early to see if you know there's a random withdrawal or whatever. Um, you know, see if DJ slipped or something like that. But I uh, know, just wake up, set your lineups in the morning. You know, have them go at 12 o'clock, watch a little golf, and then go do whatever you want to do in the afternoon. And I love the, I love it. You get to stay up a little late. No more waking up at 6 a.m. to try to run ownership. But anywho, I've rambled on for too long. It's Taco, your boy, Taco DFS back. DFSArmy.com. Check us out using the link in the description that I assume will be there on, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you know, any podcast app. If not, DFSArmy.com. Just sign up with promo code Taco. Get you a lifetime 20% off. Support the pod. Help me uh, I keep making these things. And, uh, yeah, let's get it on. Let's uh, keep it rolling with this season. And yeah, let's just win all the money. I want to win that $5 this week. Uh, best of luck to you guys, and I'll see you guys next week at the biggest sporting event on or in America, technically, the Waste Management Phoenix Open. And I'll see you guys then. Later.